Did you open? Yes. Did I'm you open the audience? I did. I'm going to look for Alicia and bring her in. Andy, we're recording. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of February 21, 2023, to order at uh, 3 o'clock. And thank committee members who are present for being here on time. So it's our guests. And uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the um, Acts of 2021 is extended, this meeting can be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by a technological means. And uh, this is a reminder to everybody that this meeting is uh, recorded and broadcast. So um, with the, those notes, I'm going to um, go through members of the committee to make sure the members of the committee can hear me and be, uh, and we can hear them. So Kathy? Yes, I'm here. All good. Bob? Present. Lynn? Present. Anna? Hello, everybody. Present. And Matt? Present, thanks. Okay, so um, there is a quorum of the Alicia's community. here, too. Alicia's here, Andy. She just joined. Hi, Alicia. Uh, you want to, and you've just con confirmed your, um, we can hear you, right? So I think that um, we can call, uh, recognize the uh, quorum of the committee is present and that we've confirmed that they can participate fully. So just going through quickly, the agenda is actually principally two items today <clears throat> with possibility of a third. We will have opportunity for public comment, um, but uh, we're gonna start with a presentation from the Community Preservation Act Committee, um, the chair of the Preservation Act Committee is present, and uh, we had invited him for the time. So um, I will start with the presentation of some Sam and questions um, of Sam. If we are going to vote today, we have a, an option of voting today on our recommendations of the council, or we could wait one week to do so. Um, I do not want to have any uh, vote of the council on a motion without having had public comment. And uh, the other item that is on the agenda, and it's a very, um, there is a technical point that I want to make very clear that, um, we're, that what was on the agenda was um, the debt exclusion and recommendations whether to place the debt exclusion on the ballot and the wording of the question. We really did vote on uh, placing a debt exclusion on the ballot for May 2nd. At the last meeting, what we did not vote was the language. And so the language is on there, but the uh, questions of the um, financing uh, and the, uh, what we're going to be uh, recommending on that is actually on the agenda for next week. Uh, so that there is a distinction as to what's on the agenda for this week and next week. Um, Sam, welcome. Um, so are you going to uh, want to have the memo with, um, on the on the screen, and um, if so, do you want to put it up, or do you want to have one one of us put it up? Well, I'm not sure what the. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Andy, uh, and uh, committee members and others. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my having not done this previously, I put together a slideshow presentation with the various projects. I th it seems to me that that's the preferred starting point. Uh, then there are two other documents that may or may not be beneficial. There's the report that was submitted to the town council that 
uh, delineate some of the details. Uh, I also want to reference a minority report on one of the projects. Two members um, had comments uh, that were uh, different than the outcome of the vote. Um, so my thought was to start with the slideshow, uh, but I would defer to the requirements of the committee, whatever that oh, might be. That's fine. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I knew if uh, you were had come prepared to put things on the screen or needed help and you've answered the question. Oh. I have them on my desktop if needed, but I think you have them as well if you're able. It's a question of navigating through the charts, whatever works best. If you're able to put the slideshow, that would be good. Whatever works best for you as far as how you think. I'd say put them on the screen as long as you're okay with me saying next and next. Okay. Um, Athena, do you want me to pull them up? Um, Andy, do, I, I can pull them up. I didn't know if Athena already had them, but I can pull them up if that's helpful. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Give me one second. Sean, I also have them if you want me to do it. Uh, sure. You can go ahead. If you have it handy, you can go ahead. I do. Sam, is this the right one? Uh, um, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I'm ready whenever. Give me the word, Andy. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you again for inviting me uh, and to to speak and for all your hard work. I know it's uh, uh, quite a quite a task. Um, I'm here to talk about our CPA recommendations and process from this past cycle, fiscal year 24. Uh, my intent is to go through a, a slideshow describing it with a brief summary of the projects, talk about them, and then thereafter open up the questions. So this is the fiscal year 24 uh, commencing in uh, June, July 1st of next year of this year, excuse me, uh, for our Community Preservation Act uh, Committee. Uh, next slide, please. I wanna call attention to our membership. Uh, we are comprised of eight individuals. We have one vacancy of member at large. Uh, I'm the chair member at large, Tim Neal, uh, vice chair, Katie Allen Zobel, member at large. Robin Fordham, uh, representing the Historical Commission. Andy McDougall, representing the Planning Board. David Williams, representing the Housing Authority. Matt Kane, representing the Recreation Commission. And Michelle Labby, representing the Conservation Commission. Um, next slide. So this is a quick uh, chart summarizing the dollar amounts of our recommended appropriation for fiscal year 24 by category. Um, community housing, we had quite a lot of, quite some very large requests. Uh, that's the largest component, 67% of the total recommended appropriation, 1.879 million and change. Uh, historical preservation, 366,759 is 13%. Open space, uh, there weren't any proposals. There was some debt financing from prior years. So it rounds down to 0%, but it's 6,180. And recreation, uh, 54650 at 19%. Again, the total uh, is $2.79,419. Uh, next slide. So this is just a list of the proposals that we recommended. There are some other proposals as well. I saw that there was another chart in the packet here that somebody put together delineating the, the proposals and the financing. This mirrors it. Um, this is by category, uh, affordable housing development for the Affordable Housing Trust, Ball Lane Community Homes, the East Street Belchertown Road Affordable Housing Project and the Amherst Community Connections Supported Housing Phase Two. In historic preservation, we have the Amherst Historical Society Museum, Mabel Loomis Todd Paintings 
restoration preservation. Uh, the Wildwood Amherst Cemetery Association, the Dickinson Farmhouse Roof, the uh, Amherst Historical Commission, uh, a historic barn and outbuilding assessment pilot program, the South Congregational Church steeple repair, no requests for open space, and in recreation, Town of Amherst, uh, recreation and passive conservation area improvements, uh, community residence for the Fort River Community Recreational Fields Project, and two from the town of Amherst relating to the War Memorial Pool, one for the bathhouse and area preliminary design, and one for the actual pool improvements. Uh, next slide. A few proposals that we also had that we did not make recommendations for. Um, there's the North Amherst Church building, uh, current church occupants being the Amherst Zion Church. Uh, which we deferred, uh, the town preparing historic preservation restrictions for CPA funded projects. We did not fund that. We'll reference that in the individual projects. The you know, Crocker Farms playground and construction at the Amherst Public Schools was withdrawn and CPA administrative expenses. It wasn't a formal proposal submittal, but we've considered 25,000 and we, un we did not fund that. Uh, next slide, please. So the first, I'm gonna go one by one on the ones we recommended. The first one was the affordable housing funding for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. They asked for in their submittal $500,000 we recommended 225,000 after discussion on an approval vote of seven, seven in favor, none against, and one member absent. Uh, we had absent member from with all of the votes. Um, this is a primary source of funding for initiating projects that relate to. Uh, uh, development for affordable housing. I'm sure the committee here is familiar with many of them. Uh, there is a current budget of 600, a current existing balance of 600,000 of CPA funds in the affordable housing trust. And that influenced our decision to award a reduced amount. Uh, I will say that we had a challenging process this year because we had requests in total that greatly exceeded our available balance. Um, before we met to uh, deliberate and vote on the various proposals, we reached out to all of the applicants and we asked them all two questions. One was, does this project need to go forward this year or could it be delayed for a different fiscal year cycle? And the other question was, can this project proceed with a lower amount than originally requested? And we received written responses from all of the different um, <clears throat> applicants, which led to some of the changes uh, uh, that existed here. So this one was a 225 recommendation. The committee supports the Affordable Housing Trust, but wanted to take into account the fact that there's an existing $600,000 balance. Uh, next slide. Community housing at the Ball Lane Community Homes uh, submitted by Valley Community Development Corporation. Um, they submitted 750,000 in their proposal and they indicated that they needed to retain that full amount. Uh, the committee voted seven in favor, uh, none against and one member absent to recommend this proposal. This is an interesting proposal for Amherst. Uh, it is to build 30 or 32, depending, basically 15 or 16 duplex houses, as indicated in the little photo here, on Ball Lane. Uh, and this is an 8.33 acre parcel. The 20 of the homes that will be developed will be restricted for sale to low to moderate income first time home buyer households with the rate remainder in uh, 10 to 12 being sold at market rate. The goal uh, of the project 
uh, it, well, is to increase the home ownership. Uh, specifically, it was backed by and funded by the Commonwealth Builder Program. Uh, and the goal of the Commonwealth Builder Program is to increase home ownership from disproportionately impacted households, uh, which is the primary source of the program, and to increase home ownership opportunities for minority households and shrink the race-based home ownership gap in the state. Uh, the $750 represents approximately 5% of the $15.8 million project and would be allocated towards development uh, costs. So the committee was uh, uh, in favor of this, uh, supporting this proposal. Next slide. The other large dollar amount housing proposal, uh, proposal was community housing on the E Street School and Belchertown Road housing. Uh, projects. They're considered to be a single proposal uh, developed or submitted by Wayfinders, who is a partner with the town. Uh, this is a an image that we're seeing right there is the um, Belchertown Road draft. This is going to lead to 70 new units that will be allocated between the two different buildings. They had asked for 1.8 million dollars initially uh, and after consulting with town staff and in recognition of the fact that the town had already provided uh, significant value with the contribution of the land and the land lease which vary between one 1.5 million dollar value uh, the town decided that it it made sense to reduce the dollar amount. We had a suggestion that there was an additional $600,000 that could be allocated from other town funds that would be previous CPA and ARPA funds for a total contribution of 1 million. Therefore, the CPA voted for 400,000. Uh, the thought was that $400,000 plus additional funds coming from other locations besides CPA would lead to a $1 million town contribution in addition to the land that was already provided. Uh, and the, the possibility that wayfinders may come back to CPA in the future. So this is a significant reduction from what was asked, but um, uh, it does provide uh, backing for the project and the committee was very much in favor of this the breakdown of the houses in this the, the units in this unit in this proposal fall within four different categories and there will be 18 units that will, must be rented to households with incomes at or below 30 percent of the median area income 27 units that must be rented to households with incomes at or below 60% of area median income, 15 units that must be rented to households that meet the mass workforce housing program requirements, and 10 units that don't have any income restrictions. It'll be a lottery process to, turn, to determine who wins or is able to rent under these programs. And that lottery process is opened up to a greater area than just Amherst. It's to the uh, New Hampshire County uh, greater area. Uh, next slide. My thought is I'll just go through these and then we'll open up the questions uh, in totality after the fact. Uh, Amherst Community Connections Phase 2. This is a repeat of a prior uh, award. This is the second cycle. Uh, $205,000, $205,200, uh, six in favor, one against, and one absent. We funded the full request for a three-year program for 12 household units. Household units is comprised of either families or individuals. Uh, typically, it's around a 50-50 basis. Uh, this is a demonstrated successful program that has both the both the funding of four hundred dollars per year, per month rent for each successful applicant, but also the requirement that they meet 
with support caseworkers and wraparound services with the goal of uh, getting the at-risk households to be independent and successful uh, after about 15 months for families and after about nine months for individuals. It's been very successful and the committee felt it appropriate to award this three-year program. Next. Next slide. So this is uh, one of the, an image of one of the um, paintings. Uh, the Amherst Historical Society and Museum uh, placed a request to restore five paintings by Mabel Loomis Todd. The paintings are in various states of disrepair. Uh, they're fragile and damaged, and the, the, the museum has selected the R. Michelson galleries to do the work on these commencing in July of next year, assuming the funding comes through. July of this year, excuse me. Um, the paintings re represent the work of a skilled female artist from an earlier time, and the museum is planning a new exhibition featuring the works later this summer, but the paintings cannot be displayed until they're repaired. Uh, so the committee voted seven in favor, zero uh, against, and one absent to fund the full request of 16,450. Um, next slide. This is a photo of the Amherst Cemetery Association, the Dickinson Farmhouse Building. I didn't realize this, but this is uh, one of the oldest houses in Amherst, built uh, around 1790. Uh, it was deeded to the Amherst Cemetery Association in 1897 by Fidelia Dickinson. Uh, the roof has uh, needs to be repaired. It has leaking and openings around the chimney, exposing the structure to ongoing damage from the elements. Uh, the CPA fund, funds will be used to fully replace the roof and underlying plywood and moldings. Uh, the original request that came in was for $143,478. After we uh, communicated what needed to get done this year, and also in, in recognition that CPA historic preservation funds cannot be used to repair chimneys, the request by the applicant was lowered to $97,020. Um, the committee added $5,000 to this proposal and to the other historic preservation building proposals uh, for HPR restrictions, historic preservation restrictions. Uh, we communicated with the state uh, CPA coalition, you indicated that the appropriate way to fund historic preservation restriction work, legal work, is to add a dollar amount to the proposal. Uh, and the town staff indicated that 5,000 seemed to be an appropriate amount for that type of work. Any unused funds would be returned uh, to the CPA committee. That is to say the $5,000 uh, HPR amount is limited specifically and exclusively to the uh, legal work. Uh, so this is an interesting building. Um, it's also houses the office of the uh, Cemetery Association um, and the committee wanted to support it. Next slide. The Amherst Historical Commission wishes to create a pilot program with the goal of reducing the volume of destruction, the, the ongoing destruction or demolition of uh, historic barns in Amherst. The original request was 15,000. It was reduced to 10,000. The assumption it would be about a two year attempt. Um, there's been about 21 barns that have been uh, demolished since 2017. Um, this plan would provide funding in partnership with owners on a 50-50 basis to get a, an assessment of what work would be needed on the barn. Uh, it's an incentive to try to spur owners to 
take action to identify what's needed to save their barns. Uh, it's a small dollar amount, and the uh, committee was in favor of supporting it. Uh, seven in favor, zero against, one absent, uh, on a pilot basis to see how it goes. Next slide. This is an image of the South Congregational Church in the town common. Uh, steeple restoration. If you look at the photo, you can see that the uh, steeple is tilted to the southeast. Um, the committee voted to award $238,289. Uh, that includes $5,000 for historic preservation restriction legal work on a seven in favor, zero against, one absent vote. Uh, the steeple is uh, at risk. It has damaged uh, supporting beams. Uh, there's an extensive proposal on the uh, committee website that you can look at, but essentially they, it needs to get repaired in a timely manner. It, it's a building that was dedicated in 1825, approaching its 200-year anniversary. Um, <clears throat> it houses a 850-pound Revere Company bell in the top, as well as a 200-pound weather vane. So um, they had to, to remove those for the time being due to the weight. The original request was $259,210. Uh, the committee, the um, church group reduced their request to $233,000. They are funding uh, the engineering work on the front end themselves. So this is something they're hoping to get done on a, on a, on a relatively soon. Next slide. This is a submittal from the town of Amherst for recreation and passive conservation area improvements. Uh, there's an ongoing backlog of work needed on the extensive trails in Amherst. There's 80 miles of trails, 2,000 acres of open space that the town manages. Uh, the work will and the funds will be applied towards repairs of trails, bridges, fog bridges, parking, signage, pieces, acceleration accessibility improvements, et cetera, uh, including materials and rental equipment. Um, it's not enough to do all of the work. Um, the town had requested $100,000. The committee voted to lower that amount to 70,000, given the current constraints that we faced on a seven to zero to one absent vote. Next slide. Uh, the Fort River Community Recreation Fields uh, Project. This is uh, an application that was submitted, proposal that was submitted by town residents as listed here on the screen. Maria Kapicki, Reed Perkins, Tony Cunningham. Uh, this seeks funding to, in support of the fields affiliated with the school project. The image here is the current existing uh, uh, layout of the fields, the actual location where the new fields will be remains to be determined. The original request came in at, I believe it was $3 million uh, and included funding for lights and a comfort station. Um, after we went back to all the applicants, they lowered the request to $2.2 million. Uh, removing the lights and the comfort stations, which uh, were separate from the fields aspect. The, this project was supported by the Amherst School Committee on a four to zero vote. Uh, and the school superintendent also expressed broad support for this proposal in that same school committee meeting, as well as for the uh, withdrawn Crocker Farm uh, playground fields. There was various discussion on this proposal among the committee. Uh, two members submitted a minority report expressing uh, an opposing view to going forward. I'll reference what, what they said in that. They objected to the uh, 
funding based on the process because it was submitted by school by town residents as opposed to an official town um, entity. Uh, this is the summation, the essence of it. Uh, the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's a significant dollar amount that will lead to uh, reduce fu future funds available to the committee to the tune of about $100,000 in each year. So they're thinking that it's a large request that would prevent uh, other projects from potentially going forward. And the third was that the, uh, excuse me, that there's a reasonable probability that this project would be able to receive funds from a different source, specifically being the town override. Therefore, if the funds were available from a town override, why would you need CPA funds? Um, that was submitted by two uh, members, Tim Neal and Andy McDougall. Uh, the other six members voted in favor of the 700,000. The absent member uh, signed on to the minority report. Uh, this had great community support. We received many, many letters and comments from uh, residents regarding the fields and the wide, wide usage among uh, residents, community members, and various sports organizations such as Ultimate Frisbee and Amherst Youth Soccer Association. Um, one aspect of it uh, that led some members to vote in favor was the uh, the prospect of value engineering reducing some of the plans for the fields. That is to say, if the budget gets tight down the road on this project and they're looking to cut, cut costs or shave various areas, uh, it's conceivable that some of the full extent of fields improvements might not be included, but with CPA funds uh, dedicated to this, that would help to retain those uh, improvements in the field. They couldn't be value engineered, engineered out, for lack of a better term. Um, next slide. So the War Memorial Pool, this is an image of it in its current or recent form. Uh, there were two uh, requests affiliated with this. One was for the bathhouse, which is on the right-hand side, just behind the tree there on the lower right, uh, and area preliminary design. Uh, it was a $200,000 request that was approved in full on a seven in favor, zero um, opposed, and one absent. Uh, the bathhouse is in significant, it's built originally in 1953. Uh, according to town staff, it's in great need of repair and soon will not be functional. Uh, but it's not just the bathhouse. There's a greater plan that Weston and Sampson had submitted to the town that would include potentially community fields in the greater area. And the question is, what might the new plan and bathhouse look like? Should it include uh, access to just the pool area, or should it include community fields, et cetera? The thought was to be deliberate in the process for coming up with a future plan that makes sense for this area and dedicating funds on the front end to that planning. So the bathhouse and the, you know, what would the greater area be? What would it look like? Uh, the committee was fully in support of this. Uh, which is why we voted to allocate and proceed with the planning. Uh, next slide. Uh, separate from the future plans in the bathhouse is the existing pool, uh, which has a number of issues. Uh, the request was from 133,000, which the town approved, the CPA committee approved on a six to one, one absent vote. Uh, the American with Disabilities Act, the lift chair is not functioning currently. Uh, the pool lining, that is to say, uh, the mount that, that retains the water needs replacement. And there's a significant water leak 
in the pool drainage system. Uh, and we were told by town staff that it's estimated loss of up to 2,000 gallons each day that the pool is filled. Uh, so there's a significant problem that exists here that needs to get addressed. And if not, this pool is not likely to stay open. Uh, there was community support in favor of this and uh, the recognition that this is a very widely utilized asset, recreational asset for the town. Okay, next slide. Um, so there were a few proposals that the committee did not uh, recommend at this time. This is an image of the historic North Amherst Church building at the intersection of Pine Street and uh, where South Pleasant meets Route 63. Uh, right by that little intersection by the old North Amherst School building. Um, it's currently occupied by the Amherst Zion Church, who are the applicants. Uh, they were seeking funding for a, a range of work that's needed, most specifically the uh, roof, but the proposal lacked some details and the committee wished to receive further details, which we hope to get sometime in the next month. Uh, the total of the secondary request, they initially asked for 650,000. When we came back asking for what do you really need for this year, they reduced the amount to 163.7. And we'll see what they say. The 163.7 represents the amount that if our proposals are all approved, will be the remaining cash balance. Uh, so we've set aside unallocated cash balance fund to consider this proposal at a later time. Uh, next slide. This is an image of the preschool playground at the Crocker Farm School. Um, widely utilized, but the applicants withdrew this proposal when we indicated and when they saw the dollar amount of requests and the available funding with the thought that they would resubmit this request next year because last year funds had been allocated for a uh, to develop a specific plan and design for the repair that has yet to occur it's apt to occur this summer and once that information arrives the applicant will be in a better position to provide a more detailed request so this was 450 supported by the school committee, but deferred uh, or withdrawn actually by the applicant. Next slide. So this was a request from the town uh, for funding for historic preservation restrictions. They had asked for $20,000, recognizing that there are various proposals where uh, CPA money is provided, but there's a need for generating the legal documentation. The committee and the town recognize, town staff recognize that the appropriate way to actually fund this is to add specific dollar amounts to approved uh, requests, such as the Dickinson Farmhouse, if it goes forward, the South Church, et cetera. So we uh, did not fund this one. Next slide. So CPA administration, we currently have about a $54,000 unused uh, dollar amount in that budget. Uh, it funds various needs, advertising, um, signage, et cetera, administration fees. The committee recognized that that uh, money could be best used elsewhere. And unlike last year, for a general reserve, we decided to not uh, retain any specific, specific general reserve fund at this time, although We'll see what occurs with the 160,000 that we're considering for allocation to the uh, North Church. Next slide. <clears throat> we also had to approve a debt service. Uh, what you see in front of you is a list of the various properties or projects that have debt schedules uh, and the various years, the project name, what year and what the duration, for example, Belchertown Road, uh, second year out of 10, 81,600. The total of all of these debt payments for fiscal year 2024 is 443,460. The committee approved it on a seven in favor, zero against and one absent. Next slide. 
So Sam, thank you very much. Yep. We're, are you, that, that's the end, right? That's it. You may want to look at the um, the report and the debt schedule. I know some folks had asked about that, but uh, if you want to talk about the specific projects, that would be fine as well. Thank you for sticking with me. So what I was thinking of doing is um, asking for questions and um, I'm going to take them in order that they came, but as questions come in about specific projects, I'm going to pause after that um, presentation and see if there are other questions about the specific que project that was the source of the first question so that we could bundle all the questions about projects uh, that um, people want to raise in a logical grouping, uh, but I don't want to go project by project because that would just take more time. So I'll start with Lynn because her hand went up first. And um, so I don't know if you have more than one project and pause after the first and we'll see. I do, first. but uh, I'm going to actually go backwards. Um, I didn't see the high the commitment to the high school field, and I'm assuming it's because we they haven't started yet. Why weren't they listed? You're referring to the um, nine to the amount that was allocated a few years ago. The debt schedule yeah. doesn't commence until the following year, not in fiscal year 2024. Okay. And, and and there was no amount to recommend for this okay. cycle. And, and there's no long-term borrowing at this point because they haven't started yet. Correct. And if we look at the report on the uh, debt schedule that I referenced a minute ago, it would be show when that would kick in. Thank you. I'm going to stop there. I have other questions, but please go ahead. Since uh, it's hard to do it any other way, if somebody has something to ask about that, uh, I should go ahead. Linda, do you want to ask any other questions if nobody's speaking up or? Kathy has her hand up. Okay, I'll go with Kathy then. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Sam, for that presentation. And I want to make a couple comments, and then I have one question. Um, I'm I'm the liaison to the CPAC group, so I, for the most part, try to either re watch afterwards, but I watch the meetings. So one comment I want to make is I think the way you've pieced together. Um, with town staff's help, um, the housing projects to make them all the big projects get in was remarkable and uh, a really and they're they're fabulous. So I just the Ball Lane one up in the North Amherst part of town. I mean, you mentioned that the community fields had a lot of support. The level of turnout when the group that's designing them showed how they were going to do that up here at Amherst by neighbors was overwhelmingly positive. Um, people were really thrilled uh, with the project. Um, it fits really well. So I'm glad that it could move forward um, because they are really big projects. So at least um, I have one other comment and then my question. Um, on the community field, I saw one of the objections was that it came from residents. I mean, the residents are also users of those fields. So there is an opening to those proposals. I actually uh, was about to draft a proposal similar to what they did. I don't know where the numbers was when I saw they'd already submitted it. And I'm, I'm on as the chair of the building committee and as a member of the finance committee and on the council and as liaison, it wasn't clear that I could even submit a proposal. So I was really delighted to see that they have one. And I spoke in favor of that. Um, I think it will, it helps a lot to show the larger community that there is support for the field aspect of the school, because this is beyond the playing fields that the, the little elementary school kids will use. So it does reduce the tax burden, but it's very explicit what it's for. So my, my question is on the housing proposals. Um, you, you clarified on East Pleasant, the East Street School in Belgerton, that we've already as a town both given a property to the trust and then bought another property. And so there's a substantial investment. And then there's another big ask that's being matched by ARPA. So it, this may be a bigger question 
Sean and Paul as these proposals come up. It would be useful, I think, to know the likelihood of the project coming back again for more money. <laughs> Um, you know, there's the the first round to ask, then there's the second round ask, and the the third. I know that level is so uncertain, but it's 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 a forward looking way on on we don't want to pull out of any of these projects at a key juncture um, and what the expectations are. So I have no problem with the project going forward, but to say that. We've already spent about 1.2 million if you do the value of the land and the outright purchase. And now we've got another 600,000 plus another $4 million. And then you said, and they may be back. Was what? And I don't know whether, I don't know whether that's also true for Ball Lane. Um, so it, it's not a question as much of you as of the town when the big housing projects come forward that we can look for, look into the future. So the, the last piece, Lynn, um, I think it's useful the way they've been doing the debt on the fields and other things is that debt schedule looks out into the future. So you can see that we're, we're paying off some of it. And so I had wondered, for example, where's the Jones Library million dollars? It's sitting there. You know, it's contingent on the project moving forward. So we haven't spent any money. And so my question on the fields is linked to that, the um, financial order that's in our packet, but the fields, the wording, my understanding, it would be contingent on the school project moving forward. You're not just giving $700,000 toward the fields. So I think somewhere we need to, to write that wording that, that we've got a contingency, um, the way you did on the uh, amount toward the track and field, that you, what it was for, but it was also contingent on the bigger projects. So it's those two comment questions on those and, and that's it. Let me let me respond quickly. I realize you referenced others uh, on the most recent comment. We actually did. I was negligent in not referencing in the presentation because I was trying to go quickly. The motion that passed for the Fort River community field, as opposed to the one by the high school, uh, was contingent upon this school override passing specifically. It was referenced within the motion that the, the award was contingent upon that. Um, regarding the uh, East Street School and Belchertown Road reference to the, they might be back, um, it was discussed, although in our conversations and questions and answers with the applicants, wayfinders, uh, they indicated that they're likely to proceed with the project regardless of whether or not CPA provides the funding, but uh, they need to come up with that funding from somewhere. And if they don't, there may be some, I'll use the phrase value engineering, they didn't, uh, to the proposal. There's various uh, enhancements uh, that, you know, bells and whistles or actually really desirable aspects of the project that might be shaved if they ran into financing problems, specifically some of the energy efficiency uh, aspects of it, uh, some of the uh, different um, certificate, they may not get these certifications for, I forget the exact phrase affiliated with it, one was passive, uh, I'll have to look it up, but there are various energy efficiency certifications that were uh, apt to occur with this proposal. And if they don't have the sufficient amount of funding, they may have to rework things. That's a- So Sam, is that with the million dollars, the, the, the amount CPA is giving plus the thing, or is that if you didn't give it? The, they came to CPA for $1.8 million and we awarded 400,000. Okay. Uh, so and their their desired initial request was for 1.8 million, which is about 6% of the total project cost. It's about a currently estimated a $30 million project. Uh, so they came for a certain amount for initial development engineering costs. Um, we had a dilemma as a committee uh, in terms of how we're gonna fund all this varying projects. Luckily town staff were fairly resourceful in uh, analyzing the situation. Uh, and in and the other thing to recognize is that the Wayfinders is in partnership with the town. They, the town went out to 
submitted bids and Wayfinders was the was awarded the proposal to come up with this plan. Um, so the answer to your question was that was based on the 1.8 million and we came in at 400,000. And based on a, before we awarded the 400,000, they said, if they ran into problems, uh, if they didn't have enough money, they're gonna have to get that money from somewhere, whatever that might be. Okay, but you said, I mean, maybe Paul and Sean or Dave, but you said the town can pull on some other resources, the ARPA money, correct? So it's not just 400. You said the total, is a million is what I heard. Yeah, we were informed of that by town staff. Uh, that was a factor in our deliberations. The CPA committee, though, has our own budget, and we voted to allocate, recommend, four hundred thousand dollars, in consideration of all the information that we received from town staff and the applicants. Okay, is it, is it okay if I add a little bit, Andy? Yeah. So, we, Kathy, we need to move on, or we're not going to. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, round one of ARPA, we allocated a million dollars for affordable housing. Um, Dave Zomack is sort of in charge of that project, and he's in contact with Wayfinders, as, as noted, they're a partner. Um, there's no set amount set in stone for how much would go there, but I think Dave's going to work with them um, to assess level of need, to make sure the project moves forward, um, but also being mindful of other sources of funding that might be available. Um, I don't think we're looking to use all of that uh, ARPA funding for this project. Um, if there's, if we can save some for other projects in the future. And Dave Thank might you. want to respond specifically to that one too. Dave, anything to add? Are any committee members uh, seeking yep. questions about this project? Also, please let me know. Andy, real quickly, I know you're 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 on on schedule here. Um, yeah, we we are. We are talking with Wayfinders. We have almost weekly meetings with them. Um, I think the number that we are currently um, uh, landed on is about 600,000 in ARPA money. So we will not be spending all of that $1 million that Sean just referenced. So to Kathy's point, earlier point, there will likely be a package of about a million dollars. Uh, and I have sent a very clear message to Wayfinders that between the land donation of the East Street School and the Belchertown Road, as well as the CPA and the ARPA funds, that the town's commitment is very strong for the project, but uh, would likely not go beyond this. Um, I will say that in the context of we are all we are all well aware of the escalating costs in construction. So I, I really want to be respectful of Wayfinders. Uh, we we all know because there are multiple projects, uh, building projects going on in town right now are being proposed. So Wayfinders is experiencing the same cost escalation that we are, uh, whether it be school, whether it be library, whether it be a uh, uh, Valley CDC's project up in North Amherst. So it's all the same environment out there. It is incredibly expensive per square foot. Um, but uh, I think a million dollars in CPA and, and ARPA and then the land donation um, uh, is hopefully um, quite a quite a nice package that we are presenting to Wayfinders, so they can then go out and, as Sam said, raise uh, roughly twenty five to thirty million in total for the project. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, anybody who from the committee have follow up questions on this, uh, Lynn, you're raising your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's really a statement, and that is that. I would hate to see us compromise on energy saving measures on any building that the town is investing in. And so if the different, and yet I know that CPA specifically can't be used that way, but this is where other funds might be. I just feel very strongly that we do not want to be building any buildings anymore that don't have the maximum energy savings we can afford. Okay, thank you. Anything else, anybody else wanting to raise them? But uh, East Street School of Elchertown Road, other guys, Bob, Agner? Yeah, I just wanted to circle back on the Fort River Recreation Fields proposal. Um, where are these fields located with respect to the floodplain, the thousand year floodplain and the other floodplains? That's the first question. The second is what are the maintenance, the annual maintenance costs, and who is going to take, who's going to assume responsibility for maintenance? Who's the question directed to? 
Yeah, but you were going to answer, but Kathy has her hand up. <laughs> okay, it's um, these will be if you think of where the current school is, Bob. This is that school comes down, and then there's four acres to the north of the new school, and part of the cost of the project is bringing raising the fill and putting some gravel underneath to get much better drainage to re reinstate the playing fields. If you think of the community fields, it's about four acres, and that pretty much becomes town recreation department. And that's the way it has been before, you know, that it's, they, those are, the schools use them too. So the question of exactly who does each piece, who mows it, but the ultimate Frisbee teams play on it. The, but there's adult softball, that's not a town's, you know, no, and a soccer teams, recreational soccer team. So um, the recreation director didn't come to the C, meeting, but I went separately to him and said, are you strongly in favor of this? He said, absolutely. Those fields are a huge part of what we have to offer the town. So, um, I, and and then, you know, I think that's the only, that I'll have to stop there because that that is clearly an issue. One of the issues for the current fields, if you want, is that they're, there's lighting on them and it's been an ongoing, who pays for that electricity? So they they divvy up the electric bills, what is actually the school's use and what, it, you know, so it's already been a, there's a recreation department part of this. So the maintenance long-term will have to be, hopefully they will be better drained and, you know, we'll have a good set of fields so that the, the major issue in the fields have been um, drainage. Yeah. And Andy, can, can I add a little bit? Um, yeah, as Kathy noted, there's a little bit of a partnership to how the grounds are maintained around Fort River between Public Works and the school staff. Um, one thing that will come back to Finance Committee at some point is in the, uh, at least in the preliminary capital plan right now, the DPW has proposed um, some additional field equipment to help better maintain some of the, the recreational fields we have. Um, you know, I think a machine like an aerator and, and similar types of things like that. So, um, so there is a request for additional funding in the capital plan currently for um, some more field equipment. Anybody else uh, just wave your hand? Anna. Thanks. Um, so I was going to, our first question is in the application for the Fort River Fields, um, do you know which option ultimately, the application included several diagrams that I think kind of get at what Bob was talking about with regards to uh, proximity to the, the actual river. And I'm curious which option is the one that's um, being utilized, like which one is the money going towards? Kathy, do you know? Yeah, it's, um, I don't have their pictures in front of them, but it's it's the pictures you've been seeing at the council. It's so it's it's directly north and it's quite far from the flood. flood. So it's, if you think of where the current school is, and where the basketball court is to the north of the school you know where that you pull into where the gym is so it's quite far from that and they've gone before the conservation commission the next comment. they've yeah. gone before the designers with the uh, site have gone in and they flagged all the area and there was an agreement on on what they demarked if you're better at I'm not using the right technical terms, but both for wetlands and for um, floodplain. So, so those two pieces, they did their due diligence through CONCOM um, to have a discussion of it. And they brought in the fields and wetlands person to talk about vegetation with er Eric. Aaron helped us a lot on that, uh, uh, helped us, help the design team. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just confirming that that was the same plan that went before CONCOM um, was, was this. So um, next question is, do, do, do. so I'm curious with the budget reductions on this, I see that the applicants removed the lighting and the bathrooms. Um, I assume that that responsibility will now go to the town if we would like to have um, comfort stations and lighting, uh, which seem important given that they're there now. Um, and so I wanted to confirm that that's not being eliminated in total, which kind of gets at my next question, which is, did the committee have discussion about how I, I am in support of this funding, um, but did the committee have a conversation on how this is not budget supplanting and what was the rationale behind that? Um, 
Yes, we did. And the uh, your first question regarding lighting and comfort stations, uh, our understanding as committee is that it's not part of the current existing proposal. It was an extra that was considered by the town residents. A good suggestion. I mean, I've been involved with the soccer association and uh, it's widely utilized to go down there on a Saturday in the spring. You'll see hundreds of kids and families. It's really a great place. Uh, but that's not that was not something that was a part of the proposal for us. Part of the uh, school building proposal. It was an original part of the Fort River applicants looking for fields money proposal. They withdrew it. The school committee voted to endorse the fields component uh, up to about 2.4 million, whatever was de desired, uh, but they did not endorse the lighting or the comfort station. So that's the answer to your first question, hopefully. Uh, the fields component did not come before the 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 uh, comfort station and the um, lighting were removed by the applicants from their request of the CPA committee. Uh, your second question was regarding, can you repeat it again? I'm sorry. Sure, um, just really briefly on that. It might be helpful if, if things, are just for record keeping in the future, it might be really helpful if applications are updated to include the updated application in the, um, on the website, because they, the only ones I have access to are the ones that still had the uh, lighting and the bathrooms in it. Um, and then the second question was, if you could address how this is not budget supplanting. Just so sure. for peace of mind, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, uh, good suggestion, Anna. And as you well know, having sat on the committee, you're familiar. Um, it was kind of a quick back and forth after the committee emailed all the applicants asking that they review their proposals in terms of is it needed this year and where can they cut costs. There was about a one week time frame where all the applicants came back to us. So uh, it didn't, we didn't ask that they updated the original proposals. It could be considered in the future. Uh, in terms of budget supplanting, uh, we had conversations in the committee. Uh, we reached out, I emailed and, and spoke with the CPA coalition. Uh, the definition of supplanting is when funding, uh, when funding has already been awarded. Uh, that is to say, if the town votes to approve the override and that plan is going forward, then it's on budget. And anything that you allocate towards that approved plan that's going forward could be considered replacing an expense that the town already has. As of right now, the school project is not approved. Uh, there's not funding for it at present. It's going to be coming before the uh, town residents uh, to uh, vote on funding for it. Until that occurs, uh, there's nothing to supplant. Uh, so the override vote and the official plans for the town would be the line of demarcation where funding might become supplanting. Another component affiliated with that on it is that uh, part of the applicant's motivation for the submittal on Fort River Fields funding was that the uh, funding could be utilized to, when it gets down to the details of actually designing and building out the program, there'll be money that can be used to retain some of the bells and whistles, for lack of a better term, of the improved fields that might not be there otherwise. So that wouldn't be supplanting either. But yeah, we did have uh, uh, thorough discussions related to that, both in the committee and we also reached out elsewhere. I'm sure you did. I, I knew I wouldn't be the first person to ask that question. I think I'm still having a little bit of a brain break around it then being contingent on the, on the um, uh, on the vote from the town, because then it yeah. does feel like it comes after, but I hear what you're saying. And I, I had I, those same I, thoughts. <laughs> um, the last question I have on this is how did you get to 700 from a uh, thousand from the 2.4 million? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, we had varying opinions on the proposals. Uh, some folks may have wanted to fund a, wanted to support it, but perhaps in a lower dollar amount. Uh, if you look at the uh, video recordings of the meetings, you'll see it. But what we wound up doing was uh, finding out who was in favor of the project to some degree and who was against the project, regardless of the dollar amount. Then from there, we incrementally proposed dollar amounts, kind of like an auction. 
would you support $200,000? Anyone who's in favor of that, raise your hand. 300,000, raise your hand. And members would drop off. And we arrived at a point uh, where it was 600,000 or 700,000 and they went to 700,000 and stopped. So we incrementally started from the bottom and see, we wanted to, at least I wanted the committee to have broad support for whatever projects we uh, were in favor of so that the uh, town and the uh, community would recognize that it wasn't you know, a controversial vote, so to speak. Um, so we just did it that way. We went incrementally. Who's in favor? Who's against? Let's start at this dollar amount. We started, I believe, at 150 or 200,000, and then we went up. They originally asked for 3 million on this particular project. It was reduced to 2.4 or 2.2 million after the comfort station and lighting was taken in. Uh, and then there was various discussion with what we could actually afford as committee and where we would go. So that's my long winded answer to your question. Thank you, Sam. Next time, what if you started at the top and went lower instead of the bottom and went up? That's Thank an alternative you. route of doing I, it. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else that somebody wants to ask about the Four River project? Kathy, is that with your hand up? Or? Uh, yeah, I just want to make one quick comment on a, on a, what's the long-term plan on lighting or comfort station. That is That clearly is a town decision, but right now uh, there is a plan on the lighting is to create a conduit box when they're redoing the fields. So if there's a desire to put lighting in, there's a place to hitch it up that it would be on its own meter, not on the school's meter. You know, so that is that's a provision in in the um, because they're going to be ripping up all the ground. So just having a, a place for the future. So, so that and and then the the displacement. It really is a discussion if we fund it now. It's part of the funding process package, and I don't know how many people remember. Sean's very elegant. Um, what's what's the debt exclusion? He has subtracted that money. He's he's in that package is assuming seven hundred thousand is being funded a different way. Um, so so it can go forward, and it's our taxpayer dollars. So I mean, we we can be packaging that way. Um, that's it. Any follow up on that, Sam? I do have one follow-up uh, comment. Uh, Lynn, you referenced the importance of uh, uh, seeking to retain uh, energy efficiencies in whatever buildings that we generate. Um, we did, as a committee, ask all the applicants a series of questions related to their projects. Uh, this was the one related to the uh, wayfinders. Uh, question 12 was, is this project likely to proceed regardless of CPA award amount? Uh, way, and the response is Wayfinders would likely proceed without receiving a CPA award, without a CPA award receiving a funding award from DHCD and mass housing may take longer than we initially projected due to local financial contribution developments that are presented to DCHD without substantial local financial contributions are not eligible for all competitive funding rounds. And here's the part that uh, addresses the energy. Additionally, we would need to reconsider pursuing enterprise green communities and passive house certifications uh, and the use of highly sustainable and resilient materials, including the installation of photovoltaics. Uh, I wanted to read that to be clearer in what their precise response was. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I was going to move on to a different topic if that's go for it. Acceptable. Okay. So the one that's sticking in my brain a little bit is actually the smallest one. So um, I, I will rely on my colleagues to tell me to move on if they feel I'm spending too much time on it. But it's the, the I think it's the smallest one, the um, historic far, uh, barn fund. So I had a couple questions on this one because it stuck out to me partially because while I was on CPA, we had um, we saw multiple or we saw different requests for different barns um, that needed renovation or needed, um, you know, wanted to be reused for other things. First off, I hear what you're saying, Sam, that, you know, this is only part of the funding that there would have to be matching funds from the owner of the barn is the vision for this. 
but it still seems like a very small amount given what we've seen in the past for cost for historic um, historic barn anything. Um, and so I was I was just noting that it does seem like a very low amount to actually make substantial change. Um, and then there have been, hang on, I'm looking. Are there restrictions that are, how do I phrase this? Is this kind of getting around a lot of the historic preservation requirements that are usually placed or that are typically placed on properties that utilize historic preservation funds? So I guess my question being, um, you know, are we are we sort of helping people to skirt having to come to CPA themselves in doing this? Because CPA funds can't be used to determine whether something is historic or not, and there are different, you know, different uh, requirements that are placed on CPA funds. So is this, and maybe that's not a, and maybe that's not a problem if it is, but are these being used to sort of skirt some of the other CPA requirements, or would funds would projects that receive these funds because they're from CPA then be bound by those CPA requirements. Does that make sense? It how, does. Far, how far do the rules go, I guess, is my question. It does, and thank you. I, I appreciate and I appreciate it when you're on the committee. Your, uh, is, there, is that me or is that someone else? Can you guys hear the feedback there? No, sorry. Okay. Uh, appreciate your detailed uh, way of looking at things. Um, this is not something that is going to circumvent uh, CPA requirements or HPR. This is an assessment program where the where the uh, output of the program would be an indication of what would be required to repair the barn. In other words, what condition is the barn in, as opposed to we're fixing it. So it's an assessment of where things stand uh, with a a match, a limited match. I mean, we're, it would be like five thousand dollars each year across the entire program. It's a pilot program uh, to try and get from the historical commission. They're the ones who this originated with them to try and get those who own barns that are uh, significant uh, to consider repairing them rather than demolishing them. So. Um, it's not for the actual work. It would be uh, an indication of what would be needed. It would be the first step, for lack of a better term, uh, in someone considering what are we going to do with our barn. I, I don't know if that answers it in detail, but that we talked about. No, it does. Yeah, it does. It's helpful. I just, I think what I wanted to know is as long as it wasn't getting at the idea of helping someone determine whether or not the barn was historic, um, or if that even mattered, because the money had been allocated to the historic commission and they can do whatever they want, not bound by CPA rules. It was a little bit of a loop in my head. So I think you answered it as best it can be answered. Yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of fine lines with all the various aspects, but the committee seemed to think it was worthwhile. And do they anticipate coming back in future years to increase the amount if this is a pilot and would it be the same amount in future years? We really don't know. That didn't come up. It was genuinely a pilot to see. Let's see how this goes. It's kind of a creative way to try and address something that's going on. Yeah, it's really, it's it's an exciting pilot. Thank you. So I have one quick question of my own. So I was waiting till the end when nobody else had questions. On Amherst Community Connections proposal, what's always been different about their proposals is that they address housing by another means than building something. It is uh, subsidizing. And um, th there's always been questions when back when I was a uh, liaison to uh, the CPA committee years ago as a member of the select board, uh, they had proposals that were of a similar nature. So I had asked this question, I think, a year ago. and. Uh, I don't, I, I, it's sort of a follow up to, to that, which is Has any attempt been made by town staff or the CPA committee to evaluate the value and success of the prior programs that have used that model um, to decide whether this is the best use of funds that are generally used for building something? for this other approach? 
Um, well, my response, if you're asking me, uh, would be no formal attempt has been made to my knowledge to specifically request the information, but when we discuss it, we do ask uh, the applicants to respond uh, with an indication of what their success rate has been in the past, uh, not from a uh, not from a subsidy versus a construction standpoint of buildings versus rent subsidies, but rather from their uh, the success of the individual families and or applicants who receive the subsidies. Um, they have a unique uh, program where they don't just provide the rental subsidies, which you're probably familiar, Andy. They they also wrap it around with support services. They mandate that any recipients uh, ha attend once a week meetings because there's all sorts of varying support programs that are out there, but it's very hard to navigate. So they have a two-phased program where the these families and individuals who are at risk or homeless or at risk of being homeless uh, can receive some support to keep them in the in the housing, but at the same time indicate that you must come in and receive some of the various support services that we have. Uh, they indicated that they've had great success with those uh, recipients of subsidies of being able to become independent. They indicated that it's about a 15 month time frame for families from when they come into the program to be able to be independent for lack of a better term. And it's a quicker process with individuals about eight months on average uh, because they don't have the same burdens that families do. So that's the extent of the inquiry that we've made informal as a part of our questions, not a formal and certainly not a comparison of the value of building units versus subsidies. Hopefully that helps. Dave, you had your hand up. Yeah, Andy, I would I would just add very briefly that I I have been a, an advocate actually for us doing kind of a deeper dive, uh, some sort of an audit and a you know looking at some of the numbers of these programs, particularly um, Amherst Community Connections, I doing most of the work that I do with my staff in in our efforts to build more housing in Amherst and in the region. Uh, I was just on a, a an hour and a half call this morning where where there is there is real there is real crisis out there in in terms of of housing availability, but there's also some hope on the horizon with with some of the monies coming down from the federal government and the state government with regard to to building more units. So. Um, I am a big advocate of of trying to build our way out of some of the the crisis that is here in the in the in the region. Um, this is not a this is not unique to Amherst. It's a regional issue. We are not going to solve it alone. We are we Amherst are not going to build our way out of this. There is far more need, far more demand than there is supply. There probably always will be, but I think the more units we build, the better. Um, but I I do think we ought to take a look at. Um, we have invested hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in this program. And I think I think it would be a good time perhaps in, in the future, you know, the next year or so to look at um, the effectiveness of, of essentially paying some of these these subsidies versus putting that funding into uh, into actually building units. So um, we we could certainly look at that um, based on your your inquiry, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. Yeah, Andy, I think my, my question was similar to yours. I, we've been seeing phase one, phase two, phase three from this same group for a couple cycle for at least since at least since 2020. And it sounds like since before then um, through CPA. And so I was just I was curious about what um, how many kind of how many years we've we've done it and, and what we know about the results so far. And I know that um, Waylon Greeny includes a lot of really, really wonderful um, statistics about how they've been able to support the community, but I wasn't sure what um, feedback the committee had asked for. And then my second question is, is the town, does the town have an official um, agreement that they've entered into with Amherst Community Connections around this program specifically? And that's a question I think for Dave. Is that is there a formal agreement in place with this program? Yeah, very, very quickly. Anyone who receives um, 
CPA fundings, there is a grant agreement that is um, developed through um, my office and the accounting department that follows all CPA dollars. So, so any recipient for any of the, the four categories uh, does have a, a grant agreement. Okay, but but beyond the CPA dollars, there's not an official agreement or partnership with the town and this particular program. Uh, beyond the CPA uh, component, Dave, okay. there's some there's some CDBG in there as well, isn't there? Or hasn't there been in the past? There has been CDBG funding in the past, not um, for this but, part of the program, but yeah, but not for this part of the program. So I, I guess Anna, yeah, there's nothing more formal beyond that that kind of partnership on a project level. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'll just uh, say that going, figuring out how long it's been since I've been on the select board, which obviously is, is predates the council being in existence. Uh, it's been at least 10 years that this program in some, essentially the same form, but with different phases has been in existence. So it might be something that is worth um, thinking about assisting the committee with the evaluation um, at the, the appropriate stage for future. Matt? Thanks, Andy. And I just want to apologize because I am traveling, so I'm not able to participate fully. But I just wanted to um, extend my thanks to Sam and the entire committee because I I am part of a similar, well, smaller, but a similar committee, the Cultural Council that does distribute um, uh, tax funds. And I, I know how um, how much time and effort and thought goes into this process. And so, you know, I just wanted to say I really appreciate that work. And then um, I do I do also appreciate the resident proposal uh, to support the fields in, in Fort River. I think that's um, a, a key piece of our overall approach to the um, project. So anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Lynn. Um, two things. I also want to say thank you to Sam and the committee and for all your hard work and explain that I've had my picture off because I'm having internet instability. And at the last meeting, I had a dramatic departure in the middle of a vote. Um, so I'm trying to avoid that. Andy, do you want to take any of these up for a recommendation to the council tonight? Um I was. I think that it is up to the committee, um, knowing what our time is and how much they want to spend for the next for the remaining items, including uh, community uh, public comment. But um, I need to remind everybody that there are two proposed orders that are in the packet and have been around for a while because they came by way of the council and. Uh, so what we will need to do either today or at our meeting a week from today um, is probably have somebody for each of these or make a motion as to whether um, the committee is recommending those orders to the council and uh, then have discussion and vote on it. Um, and I am uh, not wed to having that uh, to today, but it does have to happen uh, by next week if we're going to meet the schedule that the uh, council has, because I just so that everybody's aware of it, um, there is a um, public forum, I believe, on this schedule this, um, in the CPA uh, vote. Um, that follows, and uh, I think that the CPA vote is scheduled for March 6th. Is that uh, from what I have in my schedule? Indy, I think we actually have the forum on this. I'm I'm checking real quick, excuse me. 27th. Yeah. Um, uh, the forum is on the 27th. Yeah, it's, the forum's on the 27th. Uh, because we have to do a public forum and the council could go ahead and vote that night. And the tentative calendar, Andy, that you had, had the CPA vote on the 28th, if uh, or the finance committee's vote on the 28th, if it wasn't voted earlier. Okay, thank you. That is correct. So 
the forum on uh, CPAs on the 27th, and uh, we uh, would then we could have a vote or the committee now if, uh, our um, because I would precede the 28th. Kathy? Um, I would be in favor of taking the vote now. We have, uh, we've had a good discussion uh, and uh, we've got a longer discussion next week on a range of things. And I think these orders, the only question I have, I don't have a question on the larger order, F FY24 07A, Sean, but the order that's related to the field doesn't have the word contingency in it. So I didn't know whether you need whether that needs a slight rewording or a clause ended at the end. So those were the two orders that you talked about, right, Lynn? One yes. is for the longer list and the other is FY24-08A. And I I would be prepared to move that we recommend approval of both of these um, and I can do them in the more formal way um, if you're willing to take a motion tonight. As I said, before we got to a vote, if we were going to vote today, I wanted to allow public to uh, have public comments, since if any public comment was about this, I think that uh, uh, it, it's fair for that to precede the committee discussion. So I'm going to pause now from other activity and um, ask uh, whether there is any public comment that um, any member of the public would like to offer by indicating by raising your hand. And um, I think that everybody is on it uh, through the um, Zoom link so that they can raise a hand through the Zoom link. And uh, it does not have to be exclusively about the issue of CPA. It can be about any matter that may um, at any point come before the finance committee it's a wide open invitation for public comments we will i will ask that uh, any comments be limited to about three minutes but uh if any if there is anyone who wants to raise their hand uh please do so and uh, i also recognize that there's at least one person who's one of the co-sponsors of the uh, citizen petition item. Seeing none, seeing no request for public comment today, um, Kathy, do you have uh, motions that you wish to offer? Um, yeah, maybe if Lynn or, and or Sean can pull up uh, FY, so I read it right. <laughs> It, the first one is the F four twenty four zero seven A. Len, do you want me to pull it up? I I think I have it. Okay. And so I will. I'll make a motion, and then you can tell me whether I've worded it right. Um, I make a motion that the finance committee recommend that the council approve. Appropriation and Transfer Order FY 24-07A as illustrated. Second. Does anybody need to have it on the screen? Anyone need to have it on the screen? Lynn, I've got it if you want me to throw it up there quickly. I got it. There you go. So we all know which one we're voting on, which is the one that covers um, all of the projects except for Port River. So if there's any further discussion on this, please raise your hand. Um, and if not, I'm going to um, ask for vote. Community members are, uh, who are Voting members should be saying yes or no, and the resident members present indicate whether you support. Um, so um, I'll start with uh, Anna. Aye. Lynn. Aye. Bob. 
Uh, support. Um, Matt. Support. Bernie is absent. Kathy? Yes. And I'm a voting yes. And Alicia? Yes. Okay, so um, the vote in that is um, of voting members five yes and um, no one opposed, no abstentions. And for resident members, two members in support and one member absent. Um, Kathy, back to you. Okay, the second order, um, I make a motion that the Finance Committee recommend to the count council that they approve appropriation and borrowing authorization order FY24-08A. Uh, and then I just need to know, Sean, um, do I need to say with an amendment that this be contingent on approval of the school project, or do we would you just change the order while we're looking at it? Sonia, what do you think? I mean, I th in the past, we've always said that if there's a project description, uh, this is for the project that's been proposed and recommended. Um, so I think we've said it doesn't need that level of specificity, but Sonia, it doesn't. Okay. It it doesn't need to be contingent because the uh, the vote from the committee itself has that in it. And if the override vote goes, this project isn't moving forward. So we just come back and be rescinded. Okay. That that so I was asking us a question. So then it it stands. So second as as presented. Okay. Any discussion? No request for discussion. Uh, Lynn. Um, support. I mean, um, yes, I. Bob. Support. Matt. Support. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bernie is again absent. Kathy. Yes. I'm yes, Alicia. Yes. Donna. Yes. Okay, again, same vote as last time. Five voting members to yes, no opposed, uh, no no one absent on that one. And for the resident members, two members in support and one member absent. So uh, we've concluded that item, which then brings us over to the um, school discussion. Um, I'm not going to limit the discussion to just what's on the table, but uh, we are really um, focusing on the language this week uh, that is to that would be used as the ballot language that we're recommending to the council. And uh, then in our meeting on the 28th, we are going to discuss the debt authorization and uh, then uh, the, that will come back to the committee one last time, I believe on the 21st, after the public forum on the school project, we'd, where we will discuss and recommend action on appropriation for the school project and debt. And uh, the anticipation is that on um, April 3rd, the council will have this on the agenda on vote on the elementary school building appropriation and that. So I wanted to make that clear because I know that several people have been considering uh, matters and if it comes up in discussion, um, they, they seem that the two things that I've heard about are more focusing on the, uh, the the debt and the appropriation than they are in the language of today. So um, I guess uh, the other question is, uh, yeah. would it be helpful to have the language on the screen that would be the ballot language that's proposed? 
And uh, Sean, I'll turn it to you to, if you have it available, because you might know where to find it most readily. Uh, but in the meantime, if there are questions or uh, requests for comments, um, please raise your hand. Andy, do you want me to go ahead and put up that the, put the exclusion language? Yes. Hey, Kathy. Uh, I'm speaking to the language. OK. OK, um, thank you, Sean. As I understand it, we have to use this wording. So I'm not quite sure other than saying we recommend that we use this wording. Um, it's provided to us, uh, as the town attorney said, but also the MSBA is quite specific about the wording. Um, so since, you know, my question to you, Sean, this has been double vetted, right, that this matches what we're required to put. and. And the only, it was a related issue, just that we have a lay person's description of this so that people will know what they're voting on, but that doesn't, ref, that doesn't affect the actual wording of this. Um, uh, you need a, a genius level education to figure out what this actually says, but there would be a description, a short or two paragraph by voting yes, you will be saying the following or by voting no, you won't. So, so Andy, I'm just saying this language is fine with me because I think we, I'm not sure we can do anything to the language. And I will stop there. Okay. Um, let me uh, see if there's anybody who raises their hands who has any, any questions about this point. And what I would propose if the committee is um, amenable to this is to go ahead and take a motion to recommend this language for the ballot to the um, council and take a vote on this and be done with the language part of it today. And then see if, I, I think that Sean, you had some, uh, had done some work on questions that were raised at the last meeting, which really go into the next round of issues. And, uh, then allow for discussion for a little bit of time on those other issues that we talked about last week uh, so that people who came today wanting to have that discussion that there's a place to do it that makes sense. Is that okay? If there's no objection, then uh, Kathy, do you want to make the motion or? Sure. I, I, I move that the Finance Committee recommend the proposed debt exclusion language as displayed in, as displayed. <laughs> I'll send this up. Sorry, I'll let you second before I. It's, it's as displayed in the fifth chart of Sean's long, <laughs> long presentation, but, but as reviewed. Um, yeah. Realized we didn't do mo we didn't do seconds on the prior motions. Yes, you did. I Anna, did. Anna seconded both oh, motions. Seconded, okay. And I was about to second this one, but I don't want to be the only one who seconds today. If anyone else wants it, second. All right. <laughs> and I was just going to say, I'll send a separate standalone something dated that you can refer to more easily than the fifth slide of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, that exclusion language, uh, is there any discussion? We have motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, hey Andy, I've read it, but would you mind just reading it out loud for somebody? I, I can read it out loud. I've got it on my piece. Shall the city known as the town of Amherst be allowed to exempt from the provisions of proposition two and one half comma, so-called comma, the amounts required to pay for the bonds issued in order to construct, originally equip and furnish an elementary school on the Fort River site located at 70 Southeast Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, including the cost of architectural design, project management, 
demolition of the existing building and other necessary site improvements and all costs incidental and related to there there too <laughs> So if anyone had any doubts why we need the layperson's version of this, then um, that would be just, you know, a description of what you're voting on. Yeah. But that's the official language, Matt. Thank you, Kathy. And, and the layperson version will bring down other sources of funding and, and into the um, residence share, I assume. Yeah. And one of the things, um, well, Sean can speak to this, is that when people are voting on this wording, they're not voting on a specific amount. There is a another document that they can be looking to, but we don't in the the debt exclusion language. I'm correct, Sean and Paul, right? That the the language doesn't say you are voting on this amount of money. There is a separate document that people will know what they're voting on. So, yeah, there there will be a lot of. Um outreach and communication around the details of the project um, so that there's supplementary information when this is being considered. The, the debt authorization itself is currently scheduled to be voted on before uh, residents vote on this. Um, so when they do go to vote, they'll know whether the debt authorization has been approved. Right, by the, by the council. Yeah, thank you very much. And so I guess my question was just, when you said that um, layperson's language, do we anticipate putting uh, a number in that section of the, of the material. I realize we're not, we're not voting. Right right. So we've started, uh, we've been including the information on the total amount of debt authorized. The reason why we can't put a specific amount, at least in terms of the impact, is because we don't know uh, at this point, you know, the interest rate on the debt that we're going to get, the final construction costs. Um, there's things that theoretically can still change, which is one of the reasons why we don't peg a specific amount um, to the to this vote because of the uncertainty there. But we will include information on. So what we include information on so far is the expectation of using Eversource rebates uh, to reduce the overall amount to be borrowed, uh, the 700,000 CPA, and if any other additional funding sources are identified um, that we can reduce the, the amount to be borrowed, uh, we'll include that in the, in the information that we share out. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think that's, that's all you can do. Alicia? Um, thank you, Andy. I have a couple of things. Um, first, I just wanted to clarify that this is the language that we have to use. Um, and so I know I did say uh, the last time this came up that I was hoping that we could find, you know, some sort of adjustments that could be made to the language to make it a little bit more understandable. Um, and so I'm, again, I just want to clarify that these are the this is the maximum amount of changes we could have made to the language and this is like the best we can do. Is that the case? Andy, is it okay if I share another document? It might, because yes. the structure of, of the question is very um, prescribed. Yeah. So this okay. is this is from uh, the Department of Revenue ma uh, Mass, from Mass, um, and it lays out the wording of different types of questions. And a lot of the wording in the questions is actually spelled out in Mass General Law. Um, so the one we're, I don't know, if, can you all see this? Is it big enough? Yes. yes. Okay. So the one we're looking at here is this fourth one for debt exclusion. Uh, so you, again, you can see it's the structure. Of this is exactly how we've set it up. Shall the city town of, uh, you, you fill in the blank, be allowed to exempt the, uh, from the provisions of prop two and a half, the so-called, so the whole so-called comma section built in, uh, the amount required to pay for the bond um, issued in order to blank. And then we put in the description of the project. Um, and the description of the project is somewhat uh, is provided by our attorney to make sure it encompasses all the costs that possibly could be related um, to the project. And that's what has been reviewed by? Right, that's what MSBA, our bond council, um, the DOR, and our local council have all reviewed and approved. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, because I don't, I was viewing um, the language as you had it up on the screen. I don't have it separately open on my computer, but just to confirm that we literally use that template, like we filled in the blanks, we didn't amend the language at all. We use the template that the MSBA provided, which is based on this template, but I can, I'll send both versions out to the full committee. So you have the, um, this informational guide on prop two and a half ballot questions and also the exact language that we're proposing. 
Okay. That would be helpful. Um, and then I just still feel very uncomfortable with this ballot language only because, uh, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen. And so I know that we're saying that we can add that to the ballot question in terms of like, if you vote, yes, this is what it means. If you vote, no, this is what it means. Um, so I think it would also be really helpful to have that language. Like what exactly are we going to tell them underneath in the, des the description or the explanation that we're going to be using? Um, because for me right now, my main concern is that there is nothing in this language that will let anybody know that they are agree agreeing to compensate for the building of the school with an increase in their taxes. Like that is very unclear with this language. And so I'm wondering, like, how is that going to be made clear to people? Because right now it's just saying we're allowing the town to pay for these things, which is great. But I, I don't think this is clear that the town will then be relying on the taxpayers to increase their taxes to make up for that. So one thing I'll be working on likely with Kathy and, and others is uh, there's going to be informational guides on different components of the project. I imagine there's going to be one specifically focused on the debt exclusion, um, the impacts. We're going to try to include the information that you requested last time on resources available to those that may be struggling, whether you're a taxpayer um, or not a taxpayer. Um, you know, if, if you live in a, a rental or some other type of facility. So we're going to try to put together one maybe page front and back that has all that information in a, a one place. The timing of it, I think there's still a lot of, we're still hoping to find additional sources. So we can put one out now based on what we have available, based on the PowerPoint that we just put out um, that has what it looks like with the Eversource rebates and with CPA. Um, and we would, we would amend it if any additional funding sources are identified after that. Um, but that's, and, and always we're, uh, staff are available to support any counselors um, when you do your information sharing out about the impacts of this project, staff are happy to, to support that in any way we can. Um, thank you, Sean. Sorry, Andy, if I can just quickly follow up. I think my concern is less about having like specific numbers and like the exact percentage of an increase, but more about giving someone a general idea, like reasonable expectations as to what this means. So even saying something like this could possibly result in an increase and not even necessarily saying that like this is a percent, like a 3% increase in X, Y, and Z. Like I don't think the actual numbers are important as understanding what the possible impact could be, because right now this is essentially saying no impact or not warning of any impact. And yeah, it, certainly. Uh, Alicia, is it implicit in your question uh, um, that if you had your preference, you would like to have this printed on the ballot? I'm not saying it's possible, but is that what your preference would be if it were possible? Um, yeah, and I think other uh, counselors and other people have spoken to this, like just having the description underneath the question that says what a yes vote means and what a no vote means. I think that could be sufficient. I just would like to see that. Like, I would like to see what that would look like and how it would complement this language that we have here. Because I am also understanding that we're saying this specific language can't be changed. So I understand that. So I'm just wondering like what else we can do to make sure that voters are understanding what they're voting for. Okay. Um, as, I, I, as I previously said, I looked back on the 2016 uh, debt exclusion for the elementary school that was then not approved at town meeting. And it was the same language. And I don't believe there was anything else on the ballot then um, I'm not aware that we're allowed that flexibility, but I'm going to call on Paul. Yeah, so this is a, Alicia's pointing out something and other counselors have pointed out something that municipal officials have, have complained about for a long time, ever since Prop 2 and a half, because you're, you are restricted on the words you can put on the ballot to the words that, are in, that were in front of you. You can't add other words to it. The state law is very explicit about that. You can do information sheets, but it can't be printed on the actual ballot that people are using to vote. And so I think information sheets and all the details that you that are being requested are are good. Um, and I, I, you know, I, we can double check if there's if that's if that's wrong. But I believe that that's pretty rock solid in terms of what what you're allowed to put on the ballot. Andy, can I? Yes. Okay. 
Sure. So I had I had looked this up last time because um, I had the same question, Alicia, and we are not allowed to add that language on the ballot. Um, but I think that my question, or I know that my question is, if we can't put it on the ballot itself, um, can the town provide that information on a separate flyer that's at each polling location? So it would be a separate sheet, but it would include that um, as an unbiased, not pro or against, but just a yes vote means a no vote means, um, and not not have that be something that's you know coming from a committee for or against this project, but having it come from the school, from the town. Oof. Um, separate document, not technically on the ballot, but available with every ballot that's in person. And then the question remains about how we would um, support folks who are voting early or by mail, if that's possible. Because um, again, the law I read last last finance committee meeting was that we cannot put other language on the ballot in addition. Oh, well, yeah, I don't think you can put that in the ballot within 150 feet of the ballot. Uh, box, you know, basically, advocates can hand out information. The town can put information on its website and can share that with people. People can take the information the town prepares and share that out. But we, you, we can't be influencing. <laughs> There's no such thing as a sort of a, when the when the state does it, the Secretary of State drafts up things and they put the authors. It's not written by the state. It's written by advocates and opponents of the questions. Right. Um, so there is no such thing as a neutral information sheet but we we can share information the best we can and then advocates and opponents can use that however they see fit so yeah i think the the challenge for this is just like everybody says people want to know what's the impact this language doesn't tell me a whole lot it's saying you can borrow all the money you need to build this school and that seems like an open door and that's what's concerning to local officials when they go to the, the voters and say vote yes on this and voters read the language and they go like this seems crazy to me but Municipal officials in every city and town have struggled with this since Prop two and a half got passed. So the the short answer is that there is no legal way for us to include a yes vote means no vote means or translation of the vote in in the polling location for voters. So translation of the actual language, I believe, is available. Um, I would double check. Sorry, that. I mean, I mean, translation into plain English. Sorry, not not literal translation. Yeah, you you can't put that in the in the polling location. Okay. You can, somebody somebody standing outside can hand a piece of paper to someone saying, "Here's what a yes vote. Here's what a no vote says." From 150 feet away. Yes. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Or 50. I think it's 50 feet. But yeah. Yeah. Please. Um, I can. I don't know whether it's helpful or not, but um, in Starting to think about this, I have downloaded a few and I just found another, a Medfield one of what Sean's talking about, these information sheets. So it might be useful to just have a couple, we, it won't be the Amherst one, a couple examples, because they're very clear. Um, and they're, you know, done with all like stars around voter coming up and a yes vote means. Um, so, so so I just um, I just forward the Medfield one to Sean and Paul, but I think seeing an example of this and on what that flyer would look like that you could have someone handing out, you know that, that um, and it would be in the paper. So the more we can publicize this, so but but in answer, the actual ballot always looks the same, you know. So when Andy said he went back and looked at our old one, well, you can look at Springfields or Medfields or whatever. It's the town, the name of the town changes. <laughs> and that's that's it. Um, yeah, uh, from the yep. prior one for the elementary school, the, uh, the, the language describing the building and the, all of the uses, that was exactly the same. And I think that's because it came from MSBA. Alicia? Um, thank you. So I, I think it would be extremely helpful if we could um, create some kind of information sheet. I also think, and I know Paul said this, that it would be really important to have this information widely accessible, so available on the town website. Um, but I, I, again, think that this is incredibly important that we do this and as soon as possible, even if that means we're updating numbers as they change um, for transparency, because this is very not transparent, to be honest. Um, and so I would 
highly encourage and support that. Matt? Um, yeah, thanks, Andy. And so th this, I guess I have a substantive comment and then just a clarifying question. So, so my, my comment is just, um, I really appreciated the draft language that Paul's memo had provided to the council, which did actually set upper and lower parameters on, um, you know, the burden to taxpayers, you know, based on what percentage of MSDA funding we get and other sources of funding. So, so that, you know, that language and that vote uh, that the council takes, and then also the, um, the actual vote itself, you know, what, what is the actual vote itself? That, I think that information is going to be really important to voters as they navigate this because, you know, um, having, having that in hand really does essentially give voters a, 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 a range, right, of the, um, of the burden, the tax burden. And then my question, I guess, so I, I'm, I'm thoroughly confused now because this layperson's language that I was asking about before, that sounds as though that's the information sheet that's not allowed to be a part of the sort of official messaging you know, regarding this, which is, which is fine. I, I just think if the town gets the hard facts out, uh, out there, you know, as Paul said, um, uh, you know, the, the two sides, the two sides can, can both sort of use that information as they see fit. So uh, that's fine, but I'm totally confused now. I thought there's this lay person's language that, that Sean was referring to that was going to be an official part of the process. So the, maybe just uh, Matt, I'm not sure exactly. The, um, the maybe you can explain more of the confusion. So we will put together sort of an official fact sheet related to the project. Um, it can't go be part of the ballot. Um, it can't be sounds like within the polling location. But we can put provide that information on our website and then uh, share it out so others can communicate that out broadly um, and explore what other ways the town can officially share that out so that everyone knows. Uh, has all the same information when they're going to the going to the polls. Okay, that's that's what I needed to hear. I just I was getting confused in the discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to move to a vote. Okay. Seeing no other hands up, I'm going to go ahead and move to a vote, and I'm going to go keep going alphabetically and uh, moving down to the third name alphabetically in the list. It's uh, Bob Hegner. Um, is there a motion on the floor? <laughs> yes, the motion was made uh, and seconded. Thank you, Kathy, it, seconded by Lynn. It Dude. was okay. uh, to recommend the language right. that as as presented by John. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, I, I support this. Matt? I support. Bernie again is absent. Kathy? Yes, support. Oh, yes, I'm a yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Alicia? Yes. Ahana? Aye. And Lynn? Aye. Okay, so the vote is uh, again five for the uh, voting members, uh, five yes, no opposed. Uh, for the uh, resident members, two are in support and one member absent. So I think that, conclu um, that concludes it, but uh, Sean, did you have anything briefly you wanted to say in response to other issues that were raised last time? Yeah, so I, I uh, logged all the questions that were asked last time that said we would come back to. Um, so I'm working on a memo. I'm happy to go through the questions and answers now briefly. Um, and send the memo later, or if you'd prefer to wait till our next meeting um, and have the memo in front of you, whatever uh, the committee would like to do. Is the, let me ask if there's a request for having them um, just having a presentation now. Raise your hand. Also, looking at the clock and knowing what we're trying, what the clock is today. Otherwise, the goal would be to um, hand it out. Uh, are, are to circulate it in advance, include it in the packet uh, so that there's an opportunity to read the memo prior to the next meeting. And I already told you what the agenda looks like for the next meeting. Alicia, you have a request. So um, if there's any 
you want to um, have a full summary or do you have specific things you want to ask about? Um, no, sorry. I have a motion that I want to propose after the summary. Okay. Uh, remember that uh, since it wasn't on the agenda, um, certainly you can present your motion as Kathy has presented her motion uh, that she would like to consider, which is in the packet. So, um, so Andy, maybe for my piece, I'll just give a very quick overview of the questions and the, that I will have responses for next week. And if anyone doesn't hear one of their questions, just let me know so I can make sure that it's captured. Is that okay if I do that in two yes. minutes? Okay. Um, so the questions that we will uh, have responses for you next week. Um, how does this question came from Bernie? How does the debt exclusion, uh, the impacts on a single family household uh, differ, whether the debt is structured with level principal debt or level payment debt? So the cascading debt or the debt that stays level the whole time. Uh, will the bonds be callable for refinancing and when? Uh, how much will a $1 million reduction in the amount of debt to be repaid uh, from the debt exclusion impact the average single family household? So um, if we were to reduce project costs further, if reserves were to be used, um, what would be the impact on the um, single family household from, from that? Uh, what can we do to help taxpayers that may struggle to afford uh, the additional annual cost? And then additionally, what can we do for residents who may not pay taxes directly? Um, what can we do to support them? What is the estimated cost of repairs needed at Fort River and Wildwood? So if this project was not to move forward, what would be uh, the, the number we're looking at to bring those the two existing schools um, sort of fully up to, to code and bring their mechanical systems, uh, you know, update all, all of that? How much operational savings are anticipated from the creation of one new school um, and, and shutting down the two older facilities? And then lastly, uh, how does how do these numbers relate to the plan for the four billion projects? And how would that plan change if we were to use reserves to support this project? Uh, before I go, since you see where we're at, uh, Bob, you have questions? Yeah, I, I, I thought I had asked a question and maybe I didn't phrase it uh, well, but I wanted to know what, you know, you you, pro you provided numbers on um, how much taxes a single family home would pay, but but nothing on what the impact to renters would be in terms of, you know, increased rents. And maybe we don't have that information, but if we have that information, it would be helpful. Yeah, so uh, we don't know exactly how landlords will pass it along. We can show you what the impact would be um, on a higher valued uh, property. For example, we could look at some of the larger um, properties in town and um, that have a lot of rentals and show you what the, uh, the additional tax impact would be on them. And then how that would be allocated among renters would be up to the, the owner of that property. Uh, th that would be helpful. Anything okay. like that I think would be very helpful just so we're, we're not just limiting our discussion of impacts to homeowners. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think. Uh, I think it's great, Sean, you're pulling this together. And my request is today is what, Tuesday. If you could get it to me, um, the repairs, I know we've been back and forth. I'm doing a presentation on this weekend on the school mm -hmm. building. And I've been asked a couple times of costs of, you know, the cost of doing nothing um, right. and what's in the thing. So if you could just get me, I've said, I gave a hazy number and I said, I'm waiting for Sean to bless it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be the same number um, that we've sort of seen from the previous reports submitted to the MSBA. But um, the goal would be to get this, the, most of this is all ready together. I'll, I'll add um, the additional um, information that Bob just asked about the impact on larger parcels. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'll add that, but we should be able to get it out in the next day or so. Yeah, that'd be great. So people just know in the course of doing the analysis, Denisco did look at just Fort River and if bringing Fort River up to code and doing all the repairs that were necessary. So 
we do have some information. So in any case, I'm just, I've been waiting to see what number I can use. That would be great. Okay, thank, uh, anything else in this? Um, so thank you, Sean. Uh, the other thing that I was wanted to point out, which will get us back to Alicia is again, that uh, Kathy uh, has in a memo that is in the packet for today's meeting, which is available both on SharePoint and on the website accessible to the public for the finance committee section of the town website. Um, so that memo is outstanding and uh, will uh, be a part of the discussion next week because it fits in with the agenda item as defined, which is the, uh, uh, see if I can get to the exact language, discussion about, uh, And Andy, I don't need to speak to mine today. I'm fine yeah. waiting till next week. Uh, yeah, uh, discussion about uh, that exclusion and uh, the uh, effect, uh, the borrowing. Um, we see. Uh, let me let's just for uh, general terms about um, the funding for the project and the borrowing. Sorry about that. Alicia, um, if you would like to tell us, since uh, Kathy's shared the motion that she intends to bring, do um, you want to say anything about your motion? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, I intended to make a motion um, today that the Finance Committee recommend the Town Council to request the Town Manager include $10 million um, of capital reserves in the funding plan for the elementary school building project. Um, I was under the impression that this would fall under this agenda item and that I did not need to request another agenda item for this to be heard today. Um, and I also had sent my motion to Athena in advance to go over and make sure that it was an acceptable motion. Um, and I have a whole speech planned for today, which um, because it's vacation week, this is my only day to be at a full uh, finance committee meeting. So I am very slightly frustrated about this right now because I had planned ahead for this. Um, and I'm hoping that I will be able to be there at the next meeting. And um, although I won't be able to be sitting at a desk with my computer and my speech in front of me to present this motion. Um, I think that the, uh, the one thing that I wanted to caution you about, and I will, um, you and I should talk later about making sure that we arrange the agenda to make it most certain that you can be able to fully discuss it because uh, I think that the there are going to be uh, a lot of questions raised about this and a point about what is the um, extent of the role of the Council has and the Finance Committee has um, in the issues that are raised in the motion that you just described. So I really want to make sure that we arrange the meeting that um, can accommodate you to the greatest extent because it's not just presenting the motion, but also um, that you can participate in any discussion that follows up. If you have anything further you want to say right now as to why you're offering the motion, certainly you have the floor to do so. Um, well, I have like a whole document written that I would prefer to read when we're going, like when the motion is on the floor. Um, but I, I worry for myself. Um, if I will have the time and availability to be as present I as I would like to be while presenting a motion, just again, because on days where I'm at work, I'm literally sitting in my car on this meeting with you guys 
on my phone. And right now I'm sitting at my desk at my house with a computer. Um, and so again, this was like the best timing and I did plan ahead and I did reach out to Athena and she did go over the language and we went over the charter together. So I was doing my due diligence to make sure that this could come forward today. So again, I am just very frustrated at how these meetings are being organized and how we're not being mindful of all committee members and my participation. Um, I don't think that it's a motion that we're either prepared by the agenda or the time to take up today. I don't know if um, Sean or Paul or Lynn want to say anything additional um, on that matter, um, but uh, in addition to the question of the debt exclusion going on the ballot, the, there's a separate issue of the appropriation for the school project and the appropriation for the school project, the amount that is being um, proposed and um, the debt proposal that is being proposed is really where that fits in and uh, that's that's going to be more accurately described on the agenda for the for the next meeting um uh, sean thanks andy. thanks andy this is totally up to alicia my thought is it would be helpful to hear the motion and the justification for it um ahead of time so tonight um with the anticipation that's going to be discussed next week so that there is action next week everyone's had time to think about it um i know we don't have a ton of time left but if it's if we can hear it tonight um or if the committee can hear it tonight that would prepare you for next week's discussion that's more focused on this that's more focused on the debt authorization i you have your hand up yeah i i would um i want to respect the fact that Alicia is able to be here today and I'm curious if she's willing to um, do the the speech and kind of present the idea um, even if it's not made as a formal motion and then uh, Alicia if you wouldn't mind um, I know I do better when I'm reading things um, and so I'd love to if you can send the text of your speech as a memo if that makes sense um, for the next packet would be really helpful I do feel that um, Alicia, what you referenced and Kathy, what you put in the packet should be discussed together as they're kind of relating the same thing. And so I don't want to vote one today and save one for next week, if that makes sense, since they would not work. One wouldn't work if the other one works. So um, I, I'm wondering if that might be a happy medium for Alicia to present the, the concept and idea today um, while, she's, while she's able to be here. And then if we do it first thing in the next meeting to um, discuss both of the proposals to use reserves for different things, but as well as putting an actual written thing in the in the packet, um, if that's amenable to everyone. And I also will note, I have a really hard stop right before five, like two minutes before 5.30. So apologies for that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna call on one for a second. The specific thing that we do need to discuss next week, uh, I circled it so it's on my page and a more easy to read discuss debt authorization and uh, discussing the debt authorization the question then of reducing the debt authorization by using other funds uh, which is what really both motions are about as Anna points out really fit into the question of uh the, the the discussion of debt authorization and uh, I you know I couldn't uh, respond to you last Friday because I didn't know what the motion was at all you just said you have a motion so I did the best I could in responding which was I re realized a, not a helpful response Lynn do you have anything you want to say or although I I would like uh, us to give Alicia the opportunity to introduce uh, her motion. I don't think we should look for a second per se. 
uh, but ask her to introduce what it is she would like us to look at or recommend and to go ahead tonight because I believe that both hers and Kathy's motion may need a lot further exploration uh, before we can move on them and farther in advance. We have that information, the better off we are. And I agree, and especially because uh, we had a written memo from uh, Kathy explaining, presenting and explaining her motion uh, that's for the committee. Uh, Alicia, if you would like to have the opportunity to put it before the committee, please do so. It's your call. Um, thank you. I really appreciate everyone um, understanding and advocating. It is my preference, however, to have my explanation be at the same time that the motion is on the floor. I would be happy to write up because what I have in my speech is like talking points for me to talk, but I would be happy to formalize it and include it in the packet for next week. Um, I'm just hoping that this could be like at the top of the agenda um, so that I can, because I'm only going to probably have time for one uh, agenda item because they do go very uh, long sometimes. And I also just to speak in my defense very quickly, want to point out that in the agenda, it says further discussion about the proposed debt exclusion and recommendation whether to place it on the townwide ballot and the wording of the question. And so to me, this does fall under what is on the agenda because it is part of the discuss furthering the discussion on the proposed debt exclusion override, which is where my thought process came. Um, and I did check in with Athena who said I did not need to propose an additional agenda item. Uh, I guess the problem is that uh, I, I think the words getting confused is there are two different concepts we're talking about. The debt exclusion is specifically about the, the debt exclusion vote that we are recommending for May 2nd. And the debt authorization, which is the wording that was anticipated for the 28th of February, is the amount of debt that we're recommending to be authorized um, and because the length the uh, debt exclusion ballot language doesn't include the amount and that's why the two were separated as they were so in, in uh, and I think that's what the distinction is Sean yeah so I think um next week the only agenda item is at this, as far as I'm aware right now, is the debt authorization. So I think that makes sense um, that this could be discussed early. And it goes well with the memo that I will get you all because um, that will include information, uh, additional information that might also be part of the discussion, um, the questions that have been asked. So I don't, based on the agenda that I've seen so far, Andy, I think it makes sense that we could do it all next week. And this could be at the beginning. Yeah, it, it will, and it will be because now that I found the right place in the page and all uh, the other item we've taken care of because it's a CPA recommendation, if not voted on 221, but we did vote it. Yeah, it's all set. So there, it is the only issue on the agenda for next week. So, um, Alicia, if you're looking then to present in writing, however you decide to do it, and you know, don't hesitate to call me. Um, thank you, Andy. I did send you over a copy of my motion just about an hour before this meeting and to Athena to include in the packet, but I will write up a memo also um, and include that before next meeting. Yeah, and I'm sorry that of course, uh, tied up in some other things right up until the time of the meeting. And uh, I didn't check my email in that last hour. And that was just because of other things that were happening. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so let's just go on so we can conclude today, uh, because I think that we have a plan. 
And if you're at all concerned about process, you know how to get a hold of me, please do. And um, I think that turning to back to the agenda real quickly, I just wanted to mention one matter, and that is that um, I do need to do a report for the next um, council meeting. And uh, the report for the next council meeting won't be touching on this this particular issue that we're just talking about right now, because it hasn't even been discussed yet. It will just mention the date of the election and the language question and why the language is as limited as it is. And that's about it. Um, and I will endeavor to get this entire report to you. I also will talk about the fact that we did uh, have a further discussion about the water and sewer regulations and um, had it, the, uh, there was no, no action taken to change the previous recommendation. The one thing that I wanted to mention to you, and I'm uh, recognizing this is something that I didn't anticipate 48 hours in advance, but it was cooking along really quickly. I had a um, approach from a resident who um, lives on a private street that's not a public uh, way. And she was pointing out that she's going to be paying the higher rate for water and sewer in two years and will gain absolutely zero benefit from it because if there's ever a problem in the line to her property because she's... Uh, not in a public way um, and has an extraordinary distance to cover that she doesn't really gain anything from this. So she incurs a great risk uh, and uh, a great expense as if the old, the current rule is in a place and has no benefit from it. Um, in discussing this um, with the um, some of the staff, the principally with Amy Rusecki, um, it was also obvious that for anybody who's in an apartment complex, uh, that the apartment complex, because they also are not covered by this, that um, the owner of the building would be uh, responsible for any repairs without getting any benefit from this change in ownership language that was uh, been uh, looked at by both committees and uh, that uh, therefore the water rates would increase. And it depends on, of course, if the tenants pay it directly, which happens in some rental situations, um, or if it is a, um, and this applies to larger buildings, so I didn't know if I should um, can add that to the report, and I don't feel comfortable making a decision without running it by you. But um, if not, I will make it my own separate report uh, when it comes before the council, because I think that it raises some questions about what is the best approach uh, as to how we handle two years from now? I think it sort of strengthens the questions that have been raised by our committee as to whether we will have the full discussion of this issue in two years. And having said that, I'll um, recognize on my hands up. Sure, and I have to leave in, in about 30 seconds. So I apologize, I did not know this was going to be discussed. I, you know, respectfully, Andy, I, I disagree with some of your points and, and I don't think that they're actually necessarily, the, especially the latter point. I think that there's much more to that story with apartment buildings and what would be passed on to tenants or not. Um, and so I, I don't think that, I, personally, I do not think it should be part of a finance committee report on this matter, but I also, uh, especially given that we do not have, we're already 24 minutes over, I believe, when we're supposed to end, uh, according to the calendar, um, unless it's 5.30 and that's fine too. But um, I, I don't think it should be in the finance committee report. I think it's inappropriate given that we have not had time as a committee to discuss it. Um, I think you're welcome as a counselor to raise those questions, but uh, yeah, 
that's my take. And I know that you and I are speaking on Friday about this and I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you. I had muted myself because uh, we were having somebody barking in the background. Um, the uh, uh, I will not. That's why I wanted to raise it just as I said, if there was any objection, I was not going to include it in the report and treat it as a separate item. I will do so. I will endeavor to get the draft to you in advance as usual, but uh, I will um, leave that topic alone. Uh, and there's no reason for the committee to discuss it now because it's not an action item, nor is it appropriate because it's under unanticipated business. It's important not to have any more extensive discussion than is absolutely appropriate. Uh, so for that, uh, for those reasons, I think that we are done. And um, the um, last thing I'll just do, note to you is that uh, the work that I've been doing on trying to get a consolidated calendar together with um, um, Lynn and uh, so that we have a full picture of how the budget process is going to work. Um, anybody who has any thoughts about that or suggestions, always welcome to contact um, me about that or Lynn, whoever you believe is appropriate. So with that said, there's nothing else. Nobody's raising hands about other unanticipated business. Going once, going twice, we're adjourned. Thank, Thank you all. Have a good night.